Well, every year before I go into my burn program, I remove all fuel that's fallen in the past year from all structures, from the house, from all the outbuildings, because this area where I am standing right now is the only piece on the whole farm that's not under fire management. So here I just keep all material out of the yard and start burning from here out. One of the most unique factors of this particular tract of land is I have a lot of hillside seeps. And uh, a hillside seep is where you find your most diverse plant communities in the sand hills. And the factor that makes them so prolific in diversity is the fact they have access to water. Water is the limiting factor of all plant communities in the sand hills. And what a hillside seep is, it's where rainwater going down through the sand hits a clay lens and forces that water up to the surface. So all the plants rush in there to take advantage of that water and have done some wonderful adaptations becoming insectivorous plants and things like that. So there's just a rich diversity in these hillside seeps of orchids and insectivorous plants. I, it's a big part of my fire management is to burn these seeps to, to restore that diversity in, in, in those plant communities. Well, fire suppression comes in around the 30s and the 40s. That's when the Smokey the Bear, the Forest Service start looking at how to keep wildfires. Previous to that, it was a very common part of the Sand Hills experience to have fires moving through the landscape. So all the early families that lived here became very firewise how to live in that environment. So they adapted very early an understanding if you have a wildfire coming at your property, A, you've done a lot of work to keep all the fuels removed, but B, how do you change the direction of that fire? And the old saying, you fight fire with fire, that is the tool that they used. Fire was the tool, the main management tool that they used to keep their property from being burned up. So it was just something that everyone knew, and my mom tells great stories about being a little girl and crawling up on top of the barn to watch the fires come in out of the west while the men of the family would go out and set back fires along the creeks to pull into the head fire coming at them and change the direction of the fire to move it off from our particular farm. Well, the difference today and then was all the families who lived here had a working knowledge of fire. We lost a lot of that knowledge. It became, you know, fire became a negative uh, connotation for a lot of people. Uh, so what I run up against today is people not understanding the value of fire. Today we have a different set of considerations uh, with fire than we did when the family originally settled here, and that is because, well, one thing that I've done here on the farm is I've invited most of the landowners who are around me to come in and actually participate in burns, because that usually is the best thing that you can do is, is have someone come and do a burn with you and see how it happens and see the values of it. That is usually the best teaching tool that we have. It's exper first-hand experience. So now what we're, we're seeing in this area where we are is a lot of the larger landowners have incorporated fire into their management. So this little section that we're sitting in right here now in Western Moore County was excluded from fire for quite a bit of time and now is fairly active in its, its burn program. A lot of the landowners are participating in call share programs and, and uh, safe harbor and, and different things that kind of help them understand how fire helps them achieve their management goals. Training is a very important part of anyone's fire management plan. You have to understand fire behavior if you're going to conduct burns. And there are a lot of different programs from uh, the Nature Conservancy has programs, Forest Service has training programs, both of which I've participated in to, uh, to get up to speed in understanding the science of fire and fire behavior. So trainings become a key piece to any landowner's goal you have to get the training first to understand how to make it happen. The smoke still is something that people don't quite understand the value of the smoke, but I think most people now understand the landscape. The beauty of the landscape is only made possible by fire. So I think most people have learned to just you know, work with the smoke and say, okay, this is just part of what we have here. It's part of what makes this in, uh, area interesting. The longleaf pine is a particular species that's highly adapted to fire. 
It can grow in multiple regions, but where it does its best is where we're standing right now in the Sand Hills area. It is a species that evolved with fire, coexisted with fire, would not be here without fire. It is really the species that really shows us the relationship between something like fire and the plant communities that, that grow out of it. Everything from its grass stage up to its, its uh, full adult stage depend on having fire in that system. And everything about the, uh, the adaptive nature of the long leaf is a result of how it uh, relates to fire. Because what happens with any system is your plant community wants to move from a coniferous forest to a deciduous forest. And that was stopped here in the sand hills by the introduction or the uh, evolution of fire into that system. So even as it, when it's in the grass stage, the long leaf is highly dependent and adapted to fire and can withstand fires that would kill out all the other hardwood. The long leaf thrives in that and matter of fact, just can't be here without it. So what I've experienced in some of my areas, I can go in and conduct a fire and look at what was on the ground plant species and come back after the fire and you will see a real change up of the composition of the plants on the, on the ground as a result of that fire. Those seeds were there, they were, they were dormant, they could not uh, prosper without the fire and once you run the fire through, they come up. And there's just some very unique species in that that we find here only in the sand hills uh, that, that just make the plant community and as a result of that, the, uh, the animal community, uh, just a fascinating place to, to visit. Every species in the sand hills, whether it be insects, trees, birds, everybody is adapted in some form or fashion to fire. One of the other uh, tree species that lends itself to a good story about that adaptation is the pond pine, P-O-N-D, pond pine. And this is one right here. And one of the more fascinating parts of its life cycle is in its germination. Like all of the pines, it does have a cone. This one is not a very large cone, but what is dis distinctive about the pond pine is this cone will not open until it's exposed to fire. And you might ask, well, what's the advantage there? And the successful germination of any seed is determined by that seed landing on mineral soil. If the seed lands on to a duff layer of straw, it will not germinate. So the adaptation of this tree was why put out seed when the conditions on the ground are not favorable to successful germination. So the timing of seed release would coincide with a fire coming through, which removes all the duff layer, exposing the mineral soil so that when the pond pine does release its seed, it falls on uh, mineral soil so its germination will be successful. One of the most unique plant communities in the sand hills is known as a sand hill seep. What is a seep? As we've talked about before, historically when the large rivers came out of the Piedmont, hit the oceans, they dropped out their sediment here, created the sand hills. Depending on where you are in the gradient as you move down a slope like this, we have deep sands up here on the top of the slope and as you can see, all you're, you're, all you're getting is longleaf and wiregrass. But then as you move down slope, what happens is some of those clay deposits come up close to the surface. Well, one of the major limiting factors about with plant communities in the sand hills is water. Even though we have a lot of rainfall here, most of that water is not available to the plants because it quickly leaches down through that coarse sand and is out of range of the plants. Well, right here where that clay lens, thinking about a contact lens where that clay comes up like a contact, it comes up close to the surface, that clay will not allow that water to go down through the soil and holds it up close to the surface. So what happens now is all your plants try to come in to take advantage of that water. So you can see right here, I'm standing in wire grass, and longleaf with an occasional oak. But I take a few steps to my left here and we pick up a lot of diversity. All this is a reflection of water. Now what makes this even more fascinating is now you've got all these plants that have rushed in to take advantage of water. But what happens is 
we start picking up some shading from all those plants. So a second adaptation occurs in these seeps, and this is where we find our more fascinating plants, the insectivorous plants. And what happens with that, even though those plants are photosynthesizing, the competition is so dramatic in these areas that they picked up this advantage of being able to capture insects to augment the diet of the lack of sunlight and nutrition in these areas. So this is where if we're looking for our most fascinating uh, adaptations in the sand hills, this is where they occur in this very narrow band. And in some places it's only 20 feet wide. But these areas, high in moisture, high in competition, this is where we get our most uh, adaptation and diversity in the sand hills.